So, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to come and speak here this morning. So, um, as per the introduction, hopefully, um, you know, I'm very much at the coalface of dealing with big data with my team, and we're really going to share some of our experiences um, that we've learned over the past few years, um, and hopefully touch on a few of the themes that Rob mentioned in his keynote. So, a little bit about the Sanger Institute, for those of you who don't know. So, we're a um, research organization based uh, south of Cambridgeshire, um, and we're focused on large-scale genome sequencing. Um, we were heavily involved in the original Human Genome Project. Um, we were the single largest contributor to that. We did just over a third of the, of the public genome. Um, and our focus is really on large-scale genomic sequencing, where it has a direct impact on improving human and animal health. We're a big believer in open data, um, so we try and make as much of our data um, freely accessible to other researchers, pharma companies, you know, whoever wants to use the data. Um, this is getting a little bit more difficult um, now as we're starting to move into clinical settings and we're starting to get um, personal identifiable patient information, which we can't just um, sp spray across the internet willy-nilly, but um, where possible, we really try and make access to data as simple as possible. Um, I'm a technical person, so I lead, a, again, a, a team of, uh, uh, of kind of systems people, but our focus is really to help um, researchers get the best value out of the systems that, that we're building to, you know, to help them get research done. We're not interested in building big computer systems um, uh, just for the sake of doing so. So this is pretty much the core of our business, DNA sequencing. Um, so... This uh, blue box in the middle is a DNA sequencer. It's about the size of a large um, kind of office laser printer. And you put biological material in at one end, and you get about a terabyte a day of data coming out of the other end, um, DNA sequencing data, which researchers uh, are interested in. So as Rob said, we have to look at big data and look at what the drivers are. Um, for DNA sequencing, the big driver is the economic trends. So um, there's a kind of rule of thumb that says the cost of sequencing a genome um, drops in half every 12 months or so. So if you look at the original Human Genome Project, that was a huge multi-institute, multi-year project, um, probably half a billion dollars uh, worth of, of research in today's money. Um, if you wanted to repeat that same experiment today, you can do that on a single machine in about three days at a price point that's about $8,000. Um, and we see this trend continuing. So the $1,000 genome you know, is probably going to be here within the next 12 months, 24 months maybe. Um, and obviously this um, decreasing in the price point um, increases the amount of data that we get. Um, so no talk from a sequencing institute will be complete without the scary graph. Um, this is our data output um, over the um, past... 10 years or so, um, and you can see it's a very steeply uh, growing curve. Um, when we were doing the original human genome, our year, this is uh, basically weekly sequence output, our yearly sequence output was kind of way off the bottom of the graph. Um, so we're doing, where well, we were doing 30 gigabases of sequence uh, a year, we're now doing 7 to 10 terabases of sequence um, a week, um, a huge increase in data output, which we at the IT end, have to deal with. Um, this trend is going to continue. Um, so there's a kind of constant improvement of DNA sequencing technology. So this um, was a press release from a company called Oxford Nanopore of what the sequencing machine that they're hoping to um, release sometime this year is going to look like. So there's a little sample well where you pipette your DNA sample, and then it's USB attached, and you go and plug it into your laptop. Um, those of you in IT services organizations will be dealing, like we are, with the headache of what bring your own device um, is, where <laughs> people want to have access to uh, their, uh, all their data on their mobile uh, devices, which is very complicated. I mean, our lab people are now going to be dealing with bring your own sequencer. Um, we have no idea how this is um, going to change things, apart from we know it is going to change things. Um, and, of course, for large organizations, they're going to cluster these together up into large racks of sequences to give us the, the big throughput that, that we need. Um, so 
you know, what are you doing with all these genomes? Um, so we have uh, a number of large-scale sequencing projects. Um, so the UK 10,000 Genomes Project is one of our, our flagship projects. And what we're really looking for is, well, now we have a reference human genome, but everyone's different. Um, so if we sequence lots of genomes and then compare them, we can look at differences in genomes, perhaps correlate that with medical records and sort of find the genetic causes um, for you know, a wide range of common diseases. Um, so you know, that's useful from a, a sort of predictive point of view, but where we're going to see real benefits very, very quickly is for personalized medicine, especially um, for uh, cancer um, genetics and, and cancer treatments. Um, a lot of um, the way that your cancers respond to chemotherapy is down to the genetics and the mutations that occur inside your particular cancer cell line, and it's a for an oncologist, it's a bit of there's a big process of trial and error where if you have a patient, you have to try lots of different um, treatments to actually find one that works. And so you can spend a lot of time um, giving people drugs that aren't particularly good for them and have lots of bad side effects for no real benefit. And we hope by doing genetic sequencing of a patient's tumor sample, we can say these are the drug treatments which are likely to be successful. Um, a lot of our um, um, other projects um, also exist in frameworks of international collaboration. Um, so again, being able to share data and resources quickly on an international scale um, is kind of crucial to our success. So our IT requirements basically have to grow to match our sequencing data outputs. So historically, we have doubled our compute and um, disk capacity at the Sanger every, every 12 months. Um, so we have about 17 petabytes of of usable disk space at the Institute this year. Um, the requirements um, of the science uh, change very rapidly. Um, you know, there's this constant improvement in sequencing technology, but that improvement brings changes in laboratory process, data types, and so we have to be able to respond quickly to that. Um, and we can't just keep on throwing more money at the problem as much as uh, you know, our hardware vendors would love us to, to do that. You know, our data growth is larger than Moore's Law. The, um, cost for the disk and compute only doubles every 18 months, so there's a gap that we have to bridge somehow. Um, and so for all the talk of the $1,000 genome, well, the $1,000 genome is not going to include the computer informatics to make sense of the data afterwards, um, and that's something that um, the whole field is going to have to struggle with. So kind of, what are the, the data flows that we, we kind of tend to deal with? So at the top, we... You know, we have this sort of nice, what we call the sequencing pipeline, where we have um, DNA sequences at one end, which spit out data on a continual basis, which um, then goes to these various steps of quality control, processing, um, data analysis, um, and then is finally archived. Um, and we sort of, there are two other processes that go along with that. We move from very unstructured data, lots and lots of flat files, um, into a more structured um, set. Um, a lot of data ends up in relational databases or other sorts of queryable data stores where researchers can come and pull data down. Um, and hopefully we, we go from a, through a data reduction phase as way, well. So we go from having sort of tens of terabytes per, per experiment on the, coming off the sequencer, coming down to, you know, the really important data that a, a medical researcher may be interested in. Maybe, you know, a few megabytes. Um, does this person have this gene or not? You know, very, very small amount of data. So one of the concepts that we kind of have tried to implement from a systems point of view is to say, well, we need um, agile systems to match kind of the agile workflow and the agile development processes that our, our researchers and informaticians are going through. So um, we want to try and build modular systems so we can scale those and replicate those quickly to try and keep up with the demand, changing demands. Um, so we've built out blocks of compute and networking and storage, um, and we kind of always try and assume from day one that we, we're going to be changing it and we're going to be adding some stuff further down the line. We're not going to do a standard three-year procurement where you buy a system, plug it in, run it for three years, and then turn it off. We're going to have this constantly evolving incremental approach. Um, it means we can expand quickly by adding more blocks, and hopefully they're blocks that we've looked at before, so there's nothing new. We can use lots of automation to simplify the management of um, our systems. So as our systems 
double in size every 12 months. I don't double my team size every 12 months. Um, we have to do more with the same headcount. Um, and I guess one of the key enablers is to make storage visible everywhere. That um, we have fat networks now. You know, 10 gigabit Ethernet is a real enabling technology that allows us to have disk and compute you know, reasonably close together. But if we want to access some data from a slightly different compute cluster than we have before, well, if we've got a nice fat network, we can do that and not pay too much of a penalty for moving data around. So um, our compute modules are, are very standard. So we use commodity Intel or AMD servers. Um, we happen to like blade form factors. It fits well in our data center. Um, it's good from a data center space and management point of view. Um, we're a very embarrassingly parallel workflow. Um, so we're not running huge jobs that require um, very low latency networks like you might find in a traditional high performance compute center. We have individual tasks that don't need to go and talk to one another. Um, so it means if you add more compute, you do generally get good scaling up. If we add 1,000 more cores of compute, we get sort of a doubling of, of our throughput fairly easily. Um, we try and keep things very generic. We really haven't looked at or seen much uptake for kind of newer CPU architectures such as GPUs. Um, we really don't have the applications there at the moment to take advantage of that. Um, and we have a sort of a, a sort of footprint of about 2,000 to 10,000 cores in a sort of cluster of compute um, with a sort of reasonably modest memory size. Um, so the storage is a little bit more um, heterogeneous. We, we really ended up building two sort of sizes of storage module. Um, we have some very fast and ex um, I get shout out, shout out for saying expensive, but um, um, high-end storage arrays, um, which give us very, very high throughput, um, which we run Lustre, a high-performance file system on. But um, it's, you know an expensive solution. Um, I have to say it's a good value solution, but you know, the price per terabyte is not the most competitive one out there. Um, so we also have kind of blocks of more commodity um, storage, which is basically slower, but for the same amount of um, outlay. We can add more of them, and so if we can scale workload out across that system, then there are benefits there as well. Um, one thing we've battled with is to work out, well, how big a module should we build? Um, you know, more uh, sort of fewer modules gives you um, uh, less points of management. Um, larger modules are probably more cost effective because there are always economies of scale. But if the module breaks and goes away, um, you've lost a big chunk of real estate. Um, fewer modules means you've got more things to fail on you. Um, so we, you know, we vacillate about, you know, depending on how reliable uh, hardware has been in the past and how brave we're feeling. And that we end up with storage modules between 100 and 500 terabytes. Um, so we end up with a sort of architecture that looks, looks like this. So we have kind of various sizes of disk module and, and various um, um, silos of compute. Um, now, um, consolidation is obviously a key buzzword at the moment in the industry. Um, when we started, we thought we should build basically one big compute cluster because that gives us really good consolidation and we can balance workflows and get really good um, throughput and utilization. Um, however, we found that if you do that, we had workflows um, which were fine if they were placed on the compute cluster on their own. Um, but if you ran them both together, we'd had all sorts of horrible interactions where um, well-behaved sort of linear data flows would suddenly become randomized where you had two streams of I.O. fighting against one another. Um, and so we have found it valuable to actually step back from completely consolidating everything and give um, reasonable sort of silos of compute dedicated to specific functions. Um, so we have some very identifiable, very large projects that you know, benefit to being on their own. Smaller projects we can get away with um, um, pushing onto compute clusters with other users. Again, the key thing has been the ability to move workflows and projects between clusters uh, without having to pull the whole thing to bits and build it up again. So again, we're using software and um, workflow management tools to direct workflow between uh, clusters. So if one project has a huge um, sort of peak for compute, we can redirect workflow without having to recable anything and take downtime hits. So kind of some of the things we've learned is simple is much better than complicated. Um, there's this great um, acronym, KISS, keep it simple, stupid. Um, 
it's really easy, um, especially when we, you have enthusiastic technology people to get carried away and say, oh, we're going to build a really technically good solution that's got failover and resilience. Um, and that looks fine on paper, but what you found operationally is you know, the more layers of complicated software you put in the way, the more likely things are to break. And when they do break, they're much harder to put back together again, um, especially um, if you're hunting around for skilled people, which, again, is another theme that um, Rob uh, touched on. Um, now, that's not always possible. Um, you know, our use of high-performance file systems like Lustre is, you know, that's not simple. Um, it's a pretty big violation of the keep it simple principle, but um, that's a real need for us. We can't do it any other way, so we have to sort of bite the bullet and do that. But we you know, choose our battles. We don't go for complicated solutions everywhere. Um, the real key has also has been communication. So you know, our compute requirements are driven by the researchers, so we have to talk to them, and you have to talk to them a lot. Um, it's no good putting a system in um, which you know, meets the requirements that they had six months ago um, because they, what they want to do all have changed. Um, and we find by having this constant dialogue, um, and it helps us sort of fine-tune systems. And so we find that... Um, Researchers you know, may not know what their requirements are going to be. This is research computing. No one's ever done it before. So you build a system that's probably a little bit over spec but then they grow into it, and then as they know what their, the workflow is actually like in production, when we come to expand in six months' time, you can say, well, we don't need a really expensive compute module there. We can get away with something cheaper because we know it'll do the job, or um, you know, researchers can make a decision to say, well, I don't want to go and I don't have the budget to spend on some expensive hardware, but I can spend some developer time or some PhD student time, which, as we know, is free. Um, and we can go and uh, you know, change our workflow a bit to take, adv you know, take advantage of the systems that we can afford. Um, data triage is a really, really important um, thing. Is that, you know, we cannot keep all the data we generate. Uh, we do not have the budget for it. So we constantly have to go through this um, cycle of deciding what are we going to throw away. Um, um, and that changes. You know, researchers, until they've had data in their hands and had it for 12 months or so, don't know what was actually useful and what wasn't. Um, and you can argue you know, that process continues, that you should keep everything because you never know what's going to be useful. Um, we tend to have a slightly more pragmatic kind of... It's every 12 months or so, the sequencing pipeline teams will go and say, well, what data is actually important? No one's ever going to go back and look at data um, and reanalyze it in practice because we've got too much new data, which you know, dwarfs the old data. Um, so if no one's looked at it and the researchers come to a consensus, which is actually easier than you might think, um, to say, well, yeah, we actually don't need that bit of data, so we'll just stop collecting it. We can, we can do with what we actually, um, what, what we actually have. That, that really helps to kind of keep this big explosive growth in check. Um, so... You know, this is kind of how we ended up blocking out the sort of compute modules on, onto the sequencing pipeline. Um, sort of different numbers of cores in different parts of the pipeline and different sorts of storage. Um, so, so far so good, sort of solved problem. Um, what we've unfortunately found is life is not quite as simple as the nice linear diagram um, I show there. Um, the way researchers tend to work is, so data comes through the sequencing pipeline, and then they say, well, I've got a really new cool idea for a research project. I want to start destaging all of this data and start um, analyzing it um, with my new data. Um, and so we see this big cycle of data coming back out of data stores onto our compute farm and round and round and round and round and round. Um, and it's massively problematic because this top process is all automated, so it's all run by machines who are very good about not duplicating unnecessary data and leaving old data around. Well, this is all done by people who if you know, know that, look at your laptops and see the large amount of files littered across your desktop, that we're all really bad about organizing data and remembering where the important stuff is and keeping it all organized. Um, so we found there's this huge explosion of data kind of in, this part, in the middle of the organization that we really don't understand where it's coming from. Um, and in fact, nobody understands where it's coming from. We have this big problem of unmanaged data. You know, people take interesting data and do stuff with it. Um, doing stuff with data is hard, so it tends to mean when you've created a big data set, you don't want to move it around because it's slow, so you'll leave it where it was created. Um, 
So we get important data left in scratch areas that aren't backed up. Um, we get large amounts of data duplication. You know, no one's quite sure where the canonical data set actually is, so we'll just take another copy and, and store it somewhere. Um, you know, capacity planning becomes impossible because you can look at a real, disk real estate for a group and say they're using you know, maybe 10 petabytes of data, but you know, which bits of that data is actually taking up the disk real space? You know, trying to do a normal Unix disk usage find on a four petabyte file system is going to take a very, very long time. Yeah. And it's not just an IT problem. So we had you know, huge problems for a research group where they had a um, you know, 100 terabyte file system, which was what we were building at the time, and they'd filled it up. And that means their production stopped. Um, but they had 136 million files in that data store and had no idea which of the stuff, you know, what stuff can we delete to, um, um, so we can continue production. Um, and it's, you, know, you can see a real loss in productivity of research teams um, <laughs> because everyone's spending time just tracking, trying to keep track of their data. Um, and we saw quite quickly there was a real sort of change in IT usage between groups who had spent some time looking at data tracking and data management and those who hadn't, you know, groups who were in theory doing the same research using you know, half the amount of compute and disk space because they were only computing what they needed to compute and only keeping what they needed to compute. Um, so this kind of quickly became our problem because we did, wanted to definitely get away from lots of individual groups reinventing data management infrastructures um, which couldn't talk to one another. So we sort of took it upon ourselves to come up with a, a system that hope, uh, our researchers could live with. Um, so we've implemented a sort of data management framework using a product called IRODS, um, which has come out of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, and it's basically a sort of Mark II version of a product called Storage Resource Breaker, which has been around in the high energy physics community for quite a while. You know, these are guys who've been dealing with big data probably before most of us um, and kind of know what works and what doesn't in that space. Um, and what IRODS is, is it's basically a smart archival system. So um, basically, it's a way of, of storing data um, on it's pretty much any bit of storage you care to imagine. It's basically storage, agnostic. It can be a database, a file system, uh, Amazon S3 bucket. Um, and then it basically has a metadata catalog, which allows you to store metadata um, about it for each file. Um, and this is kind of where the power come from, comes from. So um, you get metadata that researchers can query. Um, the system itself is you know, scalable. It's been designed to deal with big data. So we can deal with millions of objects. Um, it knows about data replication. If you want to replicate data for disaster recovery purposes, very important if you're trying to build an archival system that's going to be around for a while. Um, it also has a rules and policy engine that allows you to say, you know, do things to certain types of data based on their content or their metadata. Um, one of the features that really interested us is the fact that you can federate it. So if we want to share data sets with other institutions or maybe um, merge data sets that sit in other institutions, we can merge different instances together into a single namespace to give users a, a single point of access to numerous different data stores. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like from one of the web interfaces. It's a fairly standard directory hierarchy list of files, but you know, the magic is you can say, tell me the metadata of this file, and so it'll tell you, um, you know, what experiments um, actually generated this file, um, what um, sample number, what, how it links back into our laboratory tracking system, um, you know, all things that use, uh, researchers can use to find the data that they actually want. So we've implemented one of these uh, IRODS archives for our sequencing archives. So this is basically the final resting place of all data coming off our pipelines. Um, we have um, 800 terabytes of usable space in the archive at the moment. Um, it's actually replicated between two parts of our data center, so there's actually twice as much. Um, and we have a very, very simple rule set. We basically say for every file that go, goes in, um, we check some it so we can check for silent data corruptions. Um, over the period of um, storage um, and basically just replicate it um, so we actually do have two copies of the data. Um, and you can see the growth um, up here. So we're you know, fairly aggressive growth in the archive. Um, and you know, our researchers you know, really like it. Um, you know, they're actually clamoring for us to build 
archives for them and put data in because you know, they, the benefits for, for productivity are, are very, very quick and easy wins. Um, and we really want to start, start pushing the boundaries of this system now. You know, we have uh, researchers who are kind of really keen to start looking at federation with um, um, other institutions that they're working with and, and really doing complex rule sets to kind of govern their data flows as, it, um, uh, as data gets pushed into the archive. Um, so like an architectural diagram, um, basically two sets of storage, again, various sizes of storage blocks. Yeah. Yeah. Different vendors um, will come up with different price points um, as we kind of incrementally add to the storage, and we can change storage vendors and not have to pull the whole system apart. The, being storage agnostics is a really good feature that we've made a lot of benefit from and got a lot of value from. So I'm going to wrap up now with just some thoughts about you know, cloud and how that's impacting our operations. So despite talking a lot about agile systems, it still takes a long time to actually bring hardware into a data center and cable it up and do stuff with it. Um, it's easily our longest kind of lead time in um, uh, when it comes to putting uh, new systems in. Um, so you know, cloud is an obvious solution to this problem. Um, and we're pretty cloud agnostic. We use cloud where it makes sense. Um, we have some um, misgivings about clouds for big data. And kind of the major one is it just takes a long time to get data up there. Um, certainly at the moment, we sit on Janet, like a lot of you. you know, if we want to upload data to Amazon, there is not a particularly fast link um, between us uh, and Amazon. Uh, shoveling data there is pretty inefficient. Um, having cloud providers who sit on Janet and are part of the UK um, educational research networks is obviously a very interesting thing. Um, that you know, certainly piqued our interest. Um, there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt thrown around about data security in the cloud. Um, I don't think it's a particularly, I wouldn't say big issue. It's not a, cloud isn't any different from any other bit of IT infrastructure. So if you have important data, then you should have processes that allow you to manage the risks and access controls, whether that's in your own data center or somebody else's data center. Um, it may be if you want to have really secure data, um, cloud's the right place for it. Um, you know, if you've got a, you know, most research networks are fairly open, you know, ours is, and if we want to actually bolt on a secure area onto that, it's probably much easier to start on a greenfield site out in the cloud where by default everything is locked down rather than trying to carve off bits of our infrastructure where you know, security was probably not the overriding concern. Um, but Ultimately, it's an economics decision. For most of our big data operations today, it's cheaper for us to do production in-house. However, you know, this is a purely economics decision. Um, if those prices change, or you know, when we fill up our data center and then have to perhaps do a big capital outlay to build another one, you know, cloud may well be the right solution for us. Um, so I think I'm really going to wrap up there. I think so you know, the key... Um, points that I really like to get across is that if you're getting into big data, then um, being modular so you can start small and build up over time is really important. Um, you're really having a handle on, on what data is important, what data is not, and being able to make decisions to throw data away you know, is perfectly reasonable. But in order to do that and do that successfully, you really have to engage with your researchers you know, really on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that what you're doing and what they're doing all, all really lines up. Um, so I would just like to uh, thank um, the team at the Sanger Institute. So Phil Butcher is our head of I, director of IT, who basically gives myself and my team enough rope to go and hang ourselves with um, so we can go and look at these interesting problems. Um, and uh, you know, all the informatics teams and the various scientific research groups who have kind of really helped to make uh, our IT infrastructure a success. Thank you. Thanks very much, Guy. Any questions for Guy? One down the front here. Thank you very much, Dr. Cates. Uh, you said something very interesting about data triage, which was that you are quite happy to throw data away. I wonder how you make that decision between 
um, performing continuous analysis on new data that's coming in and actually saying, you know what, we've got enough data, I'm going to do some new analysis on data that we've already kept. Um, so nobody goes back. So, so for our particular um, workflows, no one ever goes back and looks at old data and reanalyzes it. They say they want to. Um, in practice, um, the newer sequencing technologies tend to bring pretty good improvements in data quality. So um, you know, quite often, the preference is, well, the new data is better. Now, there are some cases um, um, where that may not be possible. So if you have samples that have to be ethically consented, you may not be able to go back and resequence again. Um, or you know, there are really weird edge cases. So the Neanderthal Genome Project, so that wasn't done by us. But the people who did that, they only had sort of a very, very small amount of fossil DNA, which you, know, you only get to sequence that once. So they kept everything. But for most of our stuff, um, using new data um, and analyzing that is probably better than, um, and you know, people do go back and look at the older data, but it's not the entire data set. Again, they've made the decision. So, you know, perhaps quality scores are so the sort of how, and for every base that you get off a sequencing experiment, there's a kind of a quality that says, you know, how confident are we? So, you know, do you really need that, uh, you know, five um, significant digits or do you only need good or bad? So, well, perhaps we just get away with good or bad, um, and that's, that's good enough. And so that's the process that we're going through. But it, it takes, there's about a 12-month lag time between new data appearing and then people really understanding, yeah, this is, we understand the error models. We're now confident to say we really don't care about this bit, subset of the data. We only care about this other part. Okay, thank you. Lisa, is there one quickly from Twitter? Okay, so the question was, with iRODs, how much of the metadata is created automatically and how much do you have to create by hand? So we... Maybe could you answer quite quickly? Yeah. <laughs> Our data Sorry, basically go... For that sequencing pipeline, um, the data gets put in automatically. Um, the sequencing pipeline knows who created the experiment, what sample it is, so that's what gets put in. But you can go back and manually do stuff afterwards um, if you want to. Okay. Thanks very much, Guy. Can we just... Uh, <laughs> <laughs>